Let's move on now to triglycerides. We've talked a bit about LDL and HDL. Mike, you've done a lot of work in terms of triglycerides as a risk factor. What's the latest thinking? HDL clearly, from what Christy just said, the thinking has shifted. Powerful risk marker, but not clearly something that is associated directly with atherosclerosis. What's the thinking on triglycerides? That's well, also been flip-flopping from... Right, and, and yeah, back, back 20, 30 years ago, triglycerides were basically a stepchild. Uh, so it was HDL and LDL were the, the two primary uh, components we would monitor. But triglycerides have certainly been placed uh, up in the mix. And the reason for that is we appreciate that it's, it's not so much triglycerides per se, but it's the company that triglycerides keep. So triglycerides are blood fats, but they're contained in, in these lipoproteins that when, like VLDL, when they're partially broken down, they produce a cholesterol-enriched remnant. And those cholesterol-rich remnants are particularly atherogenic, because they can get into the arterial wall, into macrophages in an unregulated manner. LDL needs to be modified, oxidized and so forth, to get in, but here is an unregulated uptake. So having a high triglyceride is associated with lots of these, number one, lots of these remnant particles, but also lots of LDL particles, and that combination can be problematic. So the worst combination is having high LDL and high triglycerides. That combination is, could be particularly devastating. So. We, we view triglycerides as important. So, so Mike, you said it's, maybe if you go back a, a little over 30 years ago, but, it, but I know back in the 80s, early 80s, there were two brothers at Bader called the Patch Brothers, Wolfgang, Joseph Patch. And what they said was, well, really, you know, we live most of our life in the postprandial state. And then in fact, their hypothesis was that for the majority of people, a low level of HDL cholesterol was a marker of delayed postprandial lipemia, and people had an increased number of triglyceride receptor proteins, they had problems with remnants, and I think they probably were right. It's just that they got, you know, ignored, and it, what ends up happening is if you have those particles hanging around a long time via CTP, you get low levels of HDL cholesterol, you have small dense LDL, and basically they said, we all know that glucose in epidemiology studies is a poor marker of risk, but hemoglobin A1C is a better marker of risk because of less variability. So they said HDL cholesterol is the hemoglobin A1C for postprandial lipemia. That basically it's a more constant, TGs bounce all over the place, and that's why it drops out in the multivariate analysis. And that really all along the problem was triglyceride rich lipoproteins, remnants. Uh, so they, I, one thing that's important clinically, when you see the low HDL cholesterol, look at the triglycerides. That's because that's, you know, you're not necessarily going to, don't try to look at the HDL, look at the triglycerides in terms of what you may be doing. You know, Christy, obviously 1980s was before I was born, but, <laughs> but, but you know, this, this, this whole triglyceride story was confounded by the fact that we had these studies of triglyceride lowering therapies, but they were done in the wrong population with the wrong agents in the wrong way. So, you know, we had a bunch of fibrate trials and they were used in people that didn't necessarily have high triglycerides. And we had a bunch of fish oil trials that were using, you know, over-the-counter, you know, a gram of over-the-counter fish oil, and they didn't work out. And, of course, we now know fairly recently, thanks to the work of Dr. Bott, that uh, therapies that were at least nominally addressing triglycerides, although they do many other things, let's be clear that, uh, you know, that they do many other things, uh, have now been shown and resulted in a rather robust reduction in morbidity mortality uh, with hazard ratios that are as good as what we see with statin trials. And, uh, you know, I think I, I wouldn't, you know, uh, try to describe the trial, but, uh, but the REDUCE trial, you know, Deepak, I'm sure you can speak to that, uh, was a real game changer because now, now that we have, we can identify a population with high triglycerides who benefit from therapies that, among other things, lower triglycerides, it really makes this a target for therapy that now needs to be widely addressed in society. Yeah, so triglycerides are back in. They're back in. But what's interesting about Reduce It is that it probably isn't all about triglycerides. I mean, triglycerides went down, what percent did they go down in your trial? Do you of course, it depends on the starting level, but 20, 25 yeah. percent. You know, and so, you know, I happen to think there's more going on than just triglyceride lowering. I don't know whether other people agree with this. Well, you so need to I, consider. I, I think the 
the, the, the major paradigm shift in the way we view triglycerides is in recognizing them again as a risk factor, right? Just the way you were talking about HDL before, right. that the patient with high triglycerides, especially in the setting of treated LDL, still represents a significant amount of untreated risk that benefits from risk-reducing therapeutics. They may be uh, with, um, you know, uh, omega-3s, they may be with additional LDL-lowering agents or newer agents on the market, but, but that, that high triglyceride level is this blinking light not to be ignored. That, to me, is the big game changer. And, and the reason for that is a hypertriglyceridemic patient uh, ha has endothelial dysfunction, has a prothrombotic tendency, a pro-inflammatory tendency, and that might be part of the reason that the reduce it study was so successful. Before we get further into the details, though, Steve, you you um, uh, mentioned something in, in terms of how you described it, and I'd just like you to put on your regulatory hat. You've done a lot of work with the FDA through the years. I think there's confusion for patients or people uh, out there and doctors as well about regulation of supplements. I don't think a lot of doctors even realize that the FDA doesn't regulate supplements in the way medicines are. They regulate it the way food is regulated, so there is some degree of oversight, but not the same sort of oversight in terms of the purity of the compound, the safety, as a prescription medication. Could you just uh, quickly it's describe what it is? It's an unmitigated public health disaster, and I've written extensively about this. Um, uh, the Congress made a terrible mistake in 1993 when they passed a law known as DSHEA which actually bars the FDA from regulating. If you call something a dietary supplement, you can sell it, you can go into your local pharmacy and you can see rows and rows and rows of these, probably 10 different fish oils. They all have a different amount of EPA and DHA. Some have very little. Uh, their content is not regulated. You have no idea what you're getting. Um, let me tell you how bad this law is. I could go out in my backyard and cut up grass clippings and put them in capsules, and put them in a bottle, and say Nissen's heart tonic. And I could sell them on the shelf of the local pharmacy, and nobody could stop me because of this law. Wait, I saw that last month in CVS. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so what you studied was a pharmaceutical grade, pure EPA drug. Now, wh you know, whether that's going to be, whether well, that's the same as EPA and DHA, you know, we don't have the answer to that. What we know is what you studied. And, you know, the regulators took a look at the trial. A panel of peers reviewed it. Uh, they voted unanimously that the study was done uh, well enough to, to warrant a label. The label hasn't been written yet, but it's going to be in the next few months. And I think that the, the lesson here to learn is what happened is the earlier therapies had an overreach. They said, well, let's just give it to everybody. You know, let's give phenofibrate to everybody and see if there's a benefit. And there wasn't. What you studied was a population where we had a very good reason to believe there might well be a benefit. And the benefit was probably, would you not agree, larger than any of us would have anticipated. I mean, it was better, a better result than we could have ever asked for. Yeah, well, it depends. I'd be interested. I don't know that I've actually asked uh, the steering committee uh, their thoughts on that, Bill. You know, we had actually calculated what we thought it might be based on the literature, yeah. and we'd come up surveying all the literature, subgroups of different trials and so forth. We'd actually anticipate there'd be a 22% relative risk reduction. But you were powered for something less. We were powered for 15%. Exactly. So you did what all good trialists do. You had a conservative. And listen, uh, I would have been happy with a 15% relative risk reduction. Uh, you ought to be happier with a 25%. Uh, and particularly, we didn't know about things like mortality. 